In this video, we're going to go over denaturation for proteins and DNA. So starting with protein denaturation, this can be defined as the disruption of secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures of a protein. So in other words, this is disrupting protein folding. Now, it's important to know that protein denaturation does not break any peptide bonds. So that's why it's written here that it affects secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures, but it does not affect primary structures. Again, you are not breaking any peptide bonds in protein denaturation. Now, denaturation, of course, is important because proteins fold to form a particular structure to carry out their functions. So if a protein is denatured, that may prevent it from functioning properly. Another important thing for LAMCAT is to know what are the conditions where a protein may be denatured. And here we have a list of the most common situations. So one of them is just extreme conditions. So if you use extreme pH, temperature, or salt concentrations, these can all disrupt protein folding. So this means if you use very low or very high pH or temperature or salt concentrations, all of these can disrupt protein folding. Other ones that are important to consider are agents. So there are reducing agents and chemical agents. So reducing agents, and a very common example is beta-mercaptoethanol, these can denature proteins because disulfide bonds formed between cysteine residues, these are formed by oxidation reactions. That means then the opposite, breaking disulfide bonds, is done through reduction. So if you introduce reducing agents, you'll break disulfide bonds and that can disrupt protein structure. Chemical agents, urea. So the structure of urea has a bunch of groups capable of forming hydrogen bonds. So when you flood your solution with urea, urea will disrupt all of the hydrogen bonds in your protein. And so if your protein forming hydrogen bond interactions with itself, it's gonna form hydrogen bonds interactions with urea and unfold. Sodium didesyl sulfate, uh, also called SDS, this is a detergent. And we're going to discuss more about this in subsequent videos. As a detergent, it is able to break and disrupt a lot of the interactions in proteins, causing them to unfold. And one other thing is that you don't have to use just a single condition, right? Any of these can denature a protein, but if you want complete denaturation, sometimes more than one of these is used. For example, in reducing SDS page, you have both sodium didesyl sulfate and reducing conditions, usually through the addition of beta mercaptoethanol. All right, so this is protein denaturation, looking at how you disrupt protein folding. Let's now take a look at DNA denaturation. So DNA, we know, has this structure called the double helix. Right, so the helix means that there's a coiled structure, but double means that it's two strands of DNA that have bound together. DNA denaturation refers to the process of separating the double-stranded DNA into single-strand DNA molecules. So you're essentially just taking the two DNA molecules and separating them from each other. This process can be done by heating. And this is actually very important because there are a number of laboratory techniques such as polymerase chain reaction where we take advantage of this. That by heating the sample, you denature the proteins and that actually creates two single-stranded templates that can be used for replicating DNA molecules. Now, through heating, while you can denature DNA, the temperature that you need to denature DNA depends on the specific DNA molecule. And one measure of this is the melting temperature, which is denoted by Tm. Tm is defined as the temperature at which half of the DNA molecules in a solution are denatured. So essentially, the higher the Tm, the higher the temperature you need to denature the DNA molecule. There are two things that the melting temperature depends on. The first is the GC ratio. So as you recall, when you look at the double helix of DNA, there are hydrogen bonds that are holding the nitrogenous bases between the two single strands together. When you look at the base pairs, you have AT base pairs, which have two hydrogen bonds, and you have GC base pairs, which have three hydrogen bonds. 
So GC ratio means within the nucleotide sequence, what percentage of the nucleosides are cytosine and guanine? And the greater that ratio, that means the more hydrogen bonds there are in that DNA molecule. And the more hydrogen bonds there are, the harder it is to denature the DNA molecule, so the TM will be higher. Another thing, of course, is, well, if the TM depends on the number of hydrogen bonds, then longer DNA molecules will, of course, have a larger melting temperature because the more nucleotides you have, the more hydrogen bond interactions you have between the two single-stranded DNA molecules. All right, so the last thing is that these two processes, uh, protein denaturation and DNA denaturation, they can be reversible. So reannealing is the process of single-stranded DNA combining to form double-stranded DNA. So essentially the, the opposite of denaturation reannealing.